You're listening to The Philosopher's Note on the courage to create. More wisdom in less time. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome to The Philosopher's Notes on The Courage to Create by Rollo May. Start with a quote. He says, The acorn becomes an oak by means of automatic growth. No commitment is necessary. The kitten similarly becomes a cat on the basis of instinct. Nature and being are identical in creatures like them. But a man or woman becomes fully human only by his or her choices and his or her commitment to them. People attain worth and dignity by the multitude of decisions they make from day to day. These decisions require courage. End quote. That's Rollo May from The Courage to Create. So Rollo May was a 20th century existential psychologist who honored the challenges of living a full life and recognized the fact that in the process of finding that light switch to our lives, we are often confronted with despair. The Courage to Create gives us some big ideas on how we can best move forward in the face of the challenges life gives us. Let's jump right in. We'll start by looking at the root of the word courage, the heart of virtue. Quote, the word courage comes from the same stem as the French word cure, pardon my French, meaning heart. Thus, just as one's heart, by pumping blood to one's arms, legs, and brain, enables all the other physical organs to function, so courage makes possible all the psychological virtues. Without courage, other values wither away into mere facsimiles of virtue. End quote. I love that. Imagine your body without your heart. You can say goodbye to your arms and legs and brain and all your other organs and, well, your life. Now, imagine your life without courage. All that love and kindness and compassion and creativity and joy and patience we live to express, gone. Courage, it's the heart of our psychological virtue system. Without it, all the values wither away into mere facsimiles of virtue. It's a powerful way to look at it, huh? All right, so courage is from the French word for heart, and we need it to pump blood to all our other virtues. But what is courage? This leads us to the next big idea, moving ahead in spite of despair. Quote, what is courage? This courage will not be the opposite of despair. We shall often be faced with despair, as indeed every sensitive person has been during the last several decades in this country. Hence Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Camus and Sartre have proclaimed that courage is not the absence of despair. It is, rather, the capacity to move ahead in spite of despair. End quote. So courage is not the absence of despair. As Rollo May says, it's the capacity to move ahead in spite of our despair. It's a really important distinction. As I've said many times in these notes, it's easy to look at people we admire and think they've arrived at a place where they no longer experience any doubts, fears, desperation, whatever. But that's just not how it is. John Eliot, in his great book, Overachievement, you can see the notes on that, says this, quote, Butterflies, cotton mouth, and a pounding heart make the finest performers smile, the smile of a person with an ace up their sleeves. They definitely would agree with Tiger Woods, who has often said, The day I'm not nervous stepping onto the first tee, that's the day I quit, end quote. And Georgia O'Keeffe says, I've been afraid every single day of my life but I've gone ahead and done it anyway, end quote. So the day Tiger Woods is not nervous stepping onto the first tee is the day he quits. And George O'Keefe has been afraid every single day of her life, but hasn't let that stop her. Unfortunately, for most of us, we won't even try something new if it makes us nervous. We've already rehearsed all the different ways it can go wrong before we even try, and then, way too often, don't dare to go for it. Eek. Or when we wake up in the morning with a pinch or a tsunami, as the case may be, 
of despair, we pull the covers over our heads and ignore the commitment we made the night before to get up early and re-begin our meditation practice or exercise regimen or whatever it is. Again, it's not about not having the despair. It's about whether or not we have the courage to move forward in spite of it. Let's go back 2,500 years and listen to what Aristotle had to say. He definitely agree with Sir Rollo May that, quote, courage is not the absence of despair. It is rather the capacity to move ahead in spite of despair. You remember Aristotle's virtuous mean? He liked to say that there were vices of excess and vices of deficiency, and that right between those vices was the virtuous mean. One of my favorite examples is the virtue of courage. So if courage is the virtuous mean, what would be the vice of deficiency? Well, if you have too little courage, you'd be a coward. You'd experience fear, despair, doubt, nerves, and you'd just run the other direction. Not so good. That is a vice of deficiency. How about a vice of excess? Well, a vice of excess in this case would be too much fearlessness. Aristotle calls that being rash. Imagine jumping out of a plane without a parachute. Not such a good idea. It's a vice of excess. So let's remember, courage is not the absence of despair, fear, or nerves. It's the willingness to go for it in spite of those kamikaze butterflies. And before we head to the next big idea, I want to take a moment to share a bit of wisdom on how to get through the despair. It's one thing to know that, you know, it'll be there at times, and it's another to know how to deal with it directly. Let's look at what Martin Seligman has to say in his great book, Learned Optimism. You can see the notes on that as well. He says this, quote, Whether or not we have hope depends on two dimensions of our explanatory style, pervasiveness and permanence. Finding temporary and specific causes for misfortune is the art of hope. Temporary causes limit helplessness in time and specific causes limit helplessness to the original situation. On the other hand, permanent causes produce helplessness far into the future, and universal causes spread helplessness through all your endeavors. Finding permanent and universal causes for misfortune is the practice of despair. The optimistic style of explaining good events is the opposite of that used for bad events. It's internal rather than external. People who believe they cause good things tend to like themselves better than people who believe good things come from other people or circumstances. End quote. So check out the philosopher's notes on learned optimism for the whole discussion on explanatory styles and how you can get your mojo on more consistently by shaping how you explain the events that are happening in your life. But for now, know that it's all about how we perceive the challenge. If you make it permanent and pervasive, meaning you think it's here to stay and that it'll apply to all aspects of your life, you just bought yourself a ticket to helplessness, which is the fastest way to depression. If, on the other hand, you make a setback or feeling of despair temporary and specific, meaning that the problem is not permanent, aka this too shall pass, and it's not pervasive, rather it's tied to the specific issue. If you do that, you'll be embracing an optimistic explanatory style that will leave you more empowered and beat your heart of courage to pump blood to all those other vital activities of your life. Of course, this is only relevant to the extent it relates to you. So, I ask, what's one area of your life in which despair, stress, angst might be slowing you down? How can you move forward in spite of that despair today? And how can you choose a more optimistic, explanatory style to rock it? Good thing to think about as we move to the next big idea, commitment and doubt and recommitment. Quote, the relationship between commitment and doubt is by no means an antagonistic one. Commitment is healthiest when it is not without doubt, but in spite of doubt. End quote. So I dig this distinction as well. If we're committed, does that mean we never have doubt and that the presence of doubt means something's wrong with us or our goals or our commitment? Not according to May. As he says, quote, Commitment is healthiest when it is not without doubt, but in spite of doubt. 
Reminds me of the wisdom I picked up from two of my favorite people and teachers, Gay and Katie Hendricks. They say that commitment is important, but recommitment is much more important. It's one thing to commit to a goal. The challenge is to recommit again and again and again and again and then and, 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 and in the face of all the doubt, second guessing, etc. So remember, courage is that virtuous mean. And recommitment is the way to deal with the healthy amount of doubt we all experience as we move toward our highest selves and the goals that matter to us. And while we're here, let's check in on your commitments. So in the PDF, I have some space here to write down. I am committed to. So what are you committed to? Press pause and think about that if you need to. But what are you really committed to in your life? All right. Think about that, and I trust you'll move forward toward that commitment and recommit and recommit and recommit in spite of the healthy doubt that may creep in. Don't forget to recommit as many times as necessary. All right, that leads us to the next big idea. Acorns, kittens, and your highest potential. I'm going to share the quote that we kick this one off with. Quote, the acorn becomes an oak by means of automatic growth. No commitment is necessary. The kitten similarly becomes a cat on the basis of instinct. Nature and being are identical in creatures like them. But a man or woman becomes fully human only by his or her choices and his or her commitment to them. People attain worth and dignity by the multitude of decisions they make from day by day. These decisions require courage. End quote. That's just amazing. Hence, I repeated it. So a kitty cat and an acorn are driven to become what they're destined to become without any commitment on their part. It just happens. May makes the important distinction that with us, we will only become fully human by the choices we make and the commitment we demonstrate to those choices. As he says, we attain worth and dignity by the multitude of decisions we make from day to day and moment to moment. And these decisions, each of them, require courage. Powerful stuff. Perhaps the most fundamental choice we will ever make is the decision to create our greatest life, to fully express our potential in these precious few years we dance on this little planet. So what choices are you making in your life, and how committed are you to them? Let's remember Ralph Waldo Emerson's comments on the subject. He says, quote, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. End quote. The next big idea is finding our center of strength. Quote, finding the center of strength within ourselves is in the long run the best contribution we can make to our fellow men. End quote. Reminds me of Wallace D. Waddles' wisdom. He says, The only service you can render to God is to give expression to what he is trying to give the world through you. The only service you can render to God is to make the very most of yourself in order that God may live in you to the utmost of your possibilities. Waddles also says, quote, Your first duty to God, to yourself, and to the world is to make yourself as great a personality in every way as you possibly can. And the very best thing you can do for the whole world is to make the most of yourself, end quote. So Rollo May makes his point in even stronger words with the next big idea, your one and only central need in life. Quote, every organism has one and only one central need in life to fulfill its own potentialities, end quote. Well, that's a strong statement. And I'm learning to take these guys literally, and women literally, so let's review that. Quote, every organism has one and only one central need in life, to fulfill its own potentialities. That echoes the wisdom of Abraham Maslow, who described the central need of human beings as the need to self-actualize, and said, quote, Musicians must make music, artists must paint, poets must write if they are to be ultimately at peace with themselves. What human beings can be, they must be. They must be true to their own nature. This need we may call self-actualization. It refers to man's desire for self-fulfillment, 
namely to the tendency for him to become actually in what he is potentially, to become everything one is capable of becoming, end quote. So are you honoring your central need to fulfill your potentiality? And you might be wondering, why is this so important? That leads us to the next big idea, betraying yourself and your community. Quote, if you do not express your own original ideas, if you do not listen to your own being, you will have betrayed yourself. Also, you will have betrayed your community in failing to make your contribution. End quote. That gets another wow. And it reminds me of Ayn Rand's comments in her introduction to The Fountainhead. You can see the notes on that great book as well, where she says, quote, It does not matter that only a few in each generation will grasp and achieve the full reality of man's proper stature, and the rest will betray it. It is those few that move the world and give life its meaning, and it is those few that I have always sought to address. The rest are no concern of mine. It is not me or the fountainhead that they will betray. It is their own souls. End quote. She also says, Anything may be betrayed, anyone may be forgiven, but not those who lack the courage of their own greatness. End quote. So how about you? Do you have the courage to express your own original ideas? Good answer. And what are your original ideas that are begging to be expressed? And what steps can you take today to more fully listen to your own being? Remember this from May. He says, quote, Whatever sphere we may be in, there is a profound joy in the realization that we are helping to form the structure of the new world. This is creative courage, however minor or fortuitous our creations may be. We can then say with the poet Joyce, Welcome, O life. We go for the millionth time to forge in the smithy of our souls the uncreated conscience of the race. End quote. Leads us to the next big idea, joy, the goal of life. Quote, joy, rather than happiness, is the goal of life, for joy is the emotion which accompanies our fulfilling our natures as human beings. It is based on the experience of one's identity as a being of worth and dignity. End quote. Love that. So many things come to mind here, from Joseph Campbell and Carlos Castaneda to Abraham Hicks and Friedrich Nietzsche. First, Campbell, Castaneda, and Abraham Hicks. Recognizing that there will be times when we feel despair, but always remembering that joy is the goal, these guys tell us that one of the best ways to know if we're on the right path is to check in with how we feel. Campbell tells us to follow our bliss. Castaneda tells us the path must have a heart. And Abraham Hicks tells us our primary job is to feel joy. I'll let them go into more detail. Abraham Hicks says, quote, If we were talking to you on your first day of physical experience, we could be of great advantage to you because we would say, quote, Welcome to planet Earth. There is nothing you cannot be or do or have. And your work here, your lifetime career, is to seek joy. End quote. Campbell says, quote, Now I came to this idea of bliss because in Sanskrit, which is the great spiritual language of the world, there are three terms that represent the brink, the jumping off place to the ocean of transcendence, sat, chit, ananda. The word sat means being, chit means consciousness, ananda means bliss or rapture. I thought, I don't know whether my consciousness is proper consciousness or not. I don't know whether what I know of my being is my proper being or not, but I do know where my rapture is, so let me hang on to rapture, and that will bring me both my consciousness and my being. I think it worked. End quote. Love that. Castaneda says, quote, Anything is one of a million paths. Therefore, a warrior must always keep in mind that a path is only a path. If he feels that he should not follow it, he must not stay with it under any conditions. His decision to keep on that path or to leave it must be free of fear or ambition. He must look at every path closely and deliberately. There is a question that a warrior has to ask mandatorily. Does this path have a heart? End quote. He continues by saying, quote, But how will I know for sure whether a path has a heart or not? 
anybody would know that. The trouble is, nobody asks the question. And finally, let's remember Nietzsche's wisdom. He says, quote, This is the manner of noble souls. They do not want to have anything for nothing, least of all life. Whoever is of the mob wants to live for nothing. We others, however, to whom life gave itself, we always think about what we might best give in return. One should not wish to end joy where one does not give joy. End quote. I love that. One of my favorite passages ever. Um, So here's to a life of giving and receiving joy as we have the courage to create. That's a quick look at a great book, The Courage to Create by Rollo May. I'm going to share a few other notes I think you'll enjoy, a little bit about Rollo, and then we'll look at some of the quotes from the sidebar. First, if you enjoyed this note, I really think you'll like the Philosopher's Notes on Motivation and Personality by Abraham Maslow. I think you'll like the Philosopher's Notes on The Wheel of Time by Carlos Castaneda and The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand and Money and the Law of Attraction by Esther and Jerry Hicks. So about Rollo May, he was born in 1909 and died in 1994. He was an American existential psychologist and authored the influential book Love and Will in 1969. Although he is often associated with humanistic psychology, he differs from other humanistic psychologists such as Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers in emphasizing the tragic dimensions of human existence. Unlike them, he built his thinking around the tenets of existential philosophy. His works include Love and Will and The Courage to Create, the latter title honoring Tillich's The Courage to Be. Uh, That's from Wikipedia where you can learn more. How about some quotes? We have the creative process must be explored not as a product of sickness, but as representing the highest degree of emotional health as the expression of the normal people in the act of actualizing themselves. These are all by Rollo May. Quote, whereas moral courage is the righting of wrongs, creative courage, in contrast, is the discovering of new forms, new symbols, new patterns on which a new society can be built. Quote, artists love to immerse themselves in chaos in order to put it into form, just as God created form out of chaos in Genesis. Forever unsatisfied with the mundane, the apathetic, the conventional, they always push on to newer worlds. And finally, courage is not a virtue of value among other personal values like love or fidelity. It is the foundation that underlies and gives reality to all other virtues and personal values. Without courage, our love pales into mere dependency. Without courage, our fidelity becomes conformism. Well, there you go. There's a quick look at The Courage to Create by Rollo May. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'm sending you my love and courage and support. Wishing you an amazing day and uh, an amazing lifetime and an amazing now. Talk to you soon. Have a great day. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this Philosopher's Note. Please go to www.philosophersnotes.com to download more.